Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moffman coming at you again. This is uh, another A push video focusing in on topic 4.8, uh, taking a look at the impact of President Andrew Jackson and federal power. Now, when we were last here together, we were talking about how the 1824 election was a really wild affair, uh, pitting four candidates together. Uh, and the House of Representatives ultimately deciding uh, in favor of John Quincy Adams, even though Jackson had a plurality of the popular and electoral college vote. Uh, the subsequent uh, corrupt bargain, as Jackson claimed it, that allowed Henry Clay to become Secretary of State. Uh, and of course, you know, basically leading to Jackson declaring war, in essence, on John Quincy Adams and making the next four years of John Quincy Adams' life pretty much a living hell. Uh, which uh, they're pretty successful in doing. So that then brings us to the next election, the election of 1828. And this is going to feature a rematch of John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. And, and note, you know, at this point in time, this is where we're, you know, we're really starting to see the breaking up of the Democratic Republican Party. It's pretty much fracturing into more northern and southern coalitions. Uh, you know, and in many respects, you know, breaking down along more traditional lines of, you know, the role of the federal government in our daily lives, amongst other things. Anyhow, uh, now, here's the thing. This, this election really wasn't about important, you know, political issues such as, you know, how much power should the federal government have? You know, should we implement the American system? You know, what should our tariffs, uh, you know, rates be and stuff like that? Really didn't come down to that. Uh, this is going to be one of the absolute nastiest presidential campaigns in American history. Uh, in many respects, this is where kind of the modern concepts of mudslinging in campaigns really starts to become manifested. Uh, and you know, to give you an idea of how you know pretty nasty it is, uh, the Jackson campaign made allegations that. Uh, the president, John Quincy Adams, back when he was the uh, United States ambassador to Russia, made claims that uh, that the then ambassador made, uh, how can I put this uh, mildly, was responsible for procuring uh, service of ladies for the royal court, if you can understand what I'm saying there. Uh, now, that's pretty harsh. You know, that's pretty harsh stuff. Uh, but the Adams campaign was maybe even worse uh, because their, one of their focus of attacks was on none other than uh, Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel Jackson. Uh, now, the Jacksons had been married a long time. We're talking about 30 years plus. But prior to them getting married, Mrs. Jackson had actually been previously married. Now, when she was first married, uh, her first husband uh, was not around very much, and then basically walked out on her. And in those days, abandonment, as it was considered, was in many states legal grounds to get a divorce. So Mrs. Jackson uh, was in the process of trying to procure a divorce from her first husband when she met a young Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew and Rachel are very much madly in love, uh, and the way that the story goes is that they travel from their home in Tennessee down to Natchez, Mississippi, and got married. Now, one might think, well, what's the problem with two young people, you know, in love getting married? Well, technically, the paperwork from Mrs. Jackson's first marriage to the man that had abandoned her and who she was divorcing had not totally been finished yet, which meant that she wasn't technically fully legally divorced at the time that she supposedly married Andrew Jackson. Now, I think in a modern context, we would kind of look at that as like, well, that's a clerical error and, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, nothing malicious in terms of intent or, you know, anything unscrupulous per se. But in 1828, uh, the idea that a woman may have technically committed bigamy, meaning being married to two different men legally at the same time, this was a major, major scandal. And basically the way the Adams campaign framed it is that they made this woman, this woman that is now, you know, in her, you know, in her 50s, uh, basically making her out to be 
a woman of very loose morals, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you know, very, very, you know, uh, you know, very intense slurs uh, for a, a woman uh, of that time, especially a woman that was, you know, considered, uh, you know, a proper lady, so to speak. So this is going to be a brutally nasty campaign that is really going to get personal. Uh, at the end of the day, though, uh, Jackson's revenge will be complete. Uh, the uh, election of 1820, 28 results, as you uh, see it. Sorry, that's my boy, uh, my dog Chubbs out there making some noise there. Chubbs, shh, Chubbs, shh, Chubbs. Uh, anyway, sorry about that. So, Chubbs, Chubbs. He gets very upset when we talk, when we talk about, you know, uh, slandering uh, Mrs. Jackson. Anyway, so that, that being said, uh, the election of 1820 is going to show where we are starting, you know, once again, we're kind of looking at some regionalism in terms of our political support. You're going to see John Quincy Adams maintaining his New England support and some support in the Mid-Atlantic. But beyond that, this is going to be a, a large turnout for Andrew Jackson. And so what happens is that in the 1828 election, the rematch between Adams and Jackson, Jackson's going to win... Uh, pretty handily. Uh, so Jackson will have his political revenge. But remember, this is going to be a personal, nasty fight. This is ju not just politics, it's personal. And what even made it more personal is that before Andrew Jackson could actually be formally inaugurated as President of the United States, uh, his wife, Rachel, suffers a heart attack and dies. Um, so she never actually is able to become technically first lady. And for Jackson, this is, this is utterly devastating. And he is convinced that the reason she had a heart attack was due to the stress that was, uh, that was kind of, you know, imposed on her by the media, fueled from, you know, these accusations from the Adams campaign that we already talked about. So in so many respects, Jackson basically blames the Adams campaign and the allies of Adams for the, the for the death of his wife. So you know, for Jackson, he's never really gonna gonna forgive a lot of these folks that were not just his political enemies, but in many respects, his personal enemies. So understand, for Jackson, on many levels, politics is personal in a way that we've really never seen it before, and this is just marking the beginning of some major, major uh, changes to how the presidency is, is going to be operating under the leadership of Andrew Jackson. So let's start to get into that a little bit. Let's at least scratch the surface. Now, when we talk about the presidency of Andrew Jackson, you have to remember that it is a milestone in many respects. First off, Jackson is the embodiment of what is now starting to be considered the American dream. You know, the idea being that you could come from nothing, and Andrew Jackson did come from nothing. He was literally dirt poor, grew up on the you know the the North Carolina South Carolina border. Uh, he was a spy, actually a teenage spy in the American Revolutionary War. He suffered a nasty gash on his face from uh, a British soldier while he was a POW. His brother actually died uh, nearby him when they were both POWs during the war, uh, and was able through raw intelligence, grit, drive, ambition to come from extremely humble origins to become a respected lawyer, a respected local and state politician in Tennessee, and then, of course, moving on to where he became most famous up till his presidency, serving in the military with victories uh, over the Creek Indians at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and, of course, being the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. So Jackson, in many respects, you know, he represents what is now starting to be defined as the American dream, that you can go from rags to riches. And he's going to have overwhelming support from what is now expanded universal white male suffrage. So for these folks that are now the electorate, the majority of the electorate now are, you know, common men now, well, Jackson is the common man's hero. He embodies what they value, a guy of grit determination, but also, you know, this, this idea of, you know, he, he, you know, he's not your old school gentleman. 
he is not afraid to be a roughneck. He is not afraid to throw down, so to speak. And I don't mean just politically, but I mean personally and physically. Uh, Jackson, you know, is the, the, the embodiment of the new rough and tumble, you know, real man uh, president that the common man, you know, certainly admired. Uh, so just be aware that he's going to have that frontier spirit in really everything that he does. You know, Jackson truly believes that he is the common man's president and that what he does really is representative of what most Americans want because most Americans are, you know, of working class, of a working class background. Uh, now, to give you a sense of how the times were changing, I don't have it written here in the notes, but uh, one thing to kind of give you a sense of is that when Jackson is inaugurated as president, uh, you know, he's going to defy tradition right off the bat. Traditionally, when you had an inauguration, following the ceremony, there was a very formal set of dances and stuff like that, you know, pretty stuffy, you know, uh, especially by modern concepts, you know, but it was, of course, a party for the elites, by the elites, that kind of thing. Well, Jackson, remember, he's not of that elite background, and he, you know, to put it uh, another way, he always tried to keep it real, so to speak. And so when the inauguration was complete for him, he decides to open up the White House to the public, the, the folks that got him into power, and basically opened up the inaugural ball into this wild, open public affair. Well, note, you know, the public back then, you know, was not afraid to chew uh, tobacco and spit on, you know, the nice carpets and rugs and not afraid to, you know, swill whiskey from the bottle and, uh, you know, drink many a, uh, many a mug of hard cider. And uh, it was a pretty wild uh, time. Uh, in fact, there was thousands of dollars of damage done to the White House as a result of this party. Uh, critics are going to call this the inaugural brawl instead of the inaugural ball. Uh, and it certainly sent a message that this is not the, you know, uptight, old, stuffy uh, class of leaders anymore. This is a common man leader with common man values that certainly uh, is always going to be trying to relate to the people. Uh, that's going to be kind of the, the, the front end of this example. On the back end of this example is what's going to be taking place at the end of his presidency. At the end of his presidency, uh, or near the end of his presidency, about you know two years towards the end of his, uh, at the end of his presidency, uh, President Jackson will receive as a gift a literal 1,400-pound wheel of cheese. Uh, now, uh, this had previously, you know, actually been a gift that Jefferson had also received. Jefferson had actually received a 1,600-pound wheel of cheese when he was president. But for Jefferson, it was a nice gift, yada, yada, and he just kind of kept it in the back. Most of it was never, ever served, and he only served it to guests and, you know, that whole thing. But this is Jackson. Jackson, you know, wanted this wheel of cheese, this, you know, enormous wheel of cheese to kind of represent his access to the public. And so what he did with this wheel of cheese is literally kept it in the foyer, the entryway into the White House. So if you entered the White House that last year or so of his presidency, there was this big giant wheel of cheese that was just aging. And at the end of his presidency, he invited the public once again to come in and chat out on some cheese. Now, it wasn't as wild an affair as the inaugural brawl, but it was just another example of, He's a president of the people. You know, come on in, have yourself some cheese. We got plenty of it. So I'm sure many of you probably did not think this was going to be including a nearly, uh, you know, nearly a ton of cheese as part of the discussion. But anyway, just understand that Jackson always is going to be trying to make himself someone relevant to the common man, someone they feel that they can relate to for sure. All right, so... Uh, we're going to leave it there for right now. Next time we pick it up, we're going to start to get into some of the other much more tangible ways that Jackson is going to start to redefine what it means to be the president of the United States. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.